Pastor Rub Danini sent me a picture of a big brown trout <laughs> that he caught. So I'm glad he had a good time and enjoyed himself. And everybody needs a day off once in a while. And uh, anyway, start off with, as Joel Olstein said, of something a little bit funny. These uh, these three. Uh, there was a rabbi and a priest and a minister and they were all standing there talking and they got to talking about money in the church and uh, how they were paid and stuff and uh, anyway the uh, the priest says well he said I take chalk and I draw a circle and he said, I throw the money in the air, and whatever lands in the circle is God's, whatever lands outside of the circle is mine. So the uh, minister, he said, well, I do just the opposite. I throw the money in the air, and whatever lands, uh, you know, vice versa, is mine. So the rabbi, he kept kind of quiet. And they said, well, what about you, rabbi? He said, well... He said, I just throw mine in the air and whatever God gets, he keeps and whatever comes down is mine. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, if I, I had a title for this message today, it would have, it, it would say, don't look back. Uh, we can't, we can't live our lives looking in the rearview mirror. How many drive down the road and only look in the rearview mirror? That wouldn't be good. <laughs> except you look once in a while to see if the cops are behind you. But anyway, but anyway, uh, you know, I, I, used to, I used to talk a lot with the, I wasn't a counselor at the boot camp, but actually I was. I, I spent hours talking to these guys. And uh, they would always focus on what happened. And I used to say to them, don't worry about what happened a year ago, a month ago, a week ago, a minute ago. Focus on the future. Because you have control of that. You have no control of what happened in the past. It's history. It's done. I said, now you can control what faces you in the future. You can change that. And, uh, and my dad always had a, a saying. He would say, don't cry over spilt milk. And that's that's pretty true. You know, we can we can live our lives 50-50 hindsight, but you cannot do anything about, uh, you know, what happened in the past. It's past. And, uh, and that's why they call today a present because it's a present to us. We, we can start each day by opening that new day and, and forging on ahead and trusting God that He has in control what, what we're facing. Nothing, He is Jehovah Rohi, our shepherd. Nothing can come through us unless it passes through His hand first. And uh, I read something the other day in the word for today. This is this is really good. The secret to victory is to let God develop you rather than let Satan destroy you. Amen. Uh, John 10.10, 10, that's what this church was founded on. The thief cometh to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come to give you life abundantly. And that's how this church is actually, that's how it got its name, Abundant Life. And uh, remember one thing, Satan wants to take back what he lost. You. Yes. He wants you back. And the only way he can get you back is uh, when you doubt, he has the power to bring you down. Especially when you look back on so-called the good old days. 
I don't know about you, but I won't want to go back. There's a song, I won't take nothing for my journey now, I gotta make it to heaven somehow, even though Satan tried to turn me around. And uh, if you look in the back of that church, there's a cross there, and there's a big divide. And there's people going across that cross, and there's people falling into the chasm, and there's people turning around. And I, actually, I had a little sermon with the inmates that were here one time on that. They noticed that. And, uh, but uh, anyway, when <clears throat> the devil, he's not out to annoy you. He's out to destroy you. And if it wouldn't be for the blood of Jesus, we have, we have a full threefold protection. We have the blood of Jesus that covers us. And we have the full armor of God. Plus, he says, my and angels encamp at the roundabout those I love. Because I'm going to tell you something. Satan isn't a gentleman. If the angels weren't around us, he'd get us from behind. And just remember one thing else, too. There is no armor in the back. When, when David fought Goliath, it said... He was calling curses down on David, and David picked the stones out, and he ran towards Goliath. He didn't run from him. It said that he could he could hurl that weave that a uh, spear the length of a football field. So knowing David, if I were him, I would have stayed a football field away from him. <laughs> but he did run towards him, and he he had one spot. Right here, and that's where he the, he slung the stone, and it, it it brought the giant down. But anyway, uh, you know when we look back, uh, we're we're going to get into a couple scriptures here. Uh, it's a type of sin. It's it's the Egypt sin. When the Israelites were in the desert, they kept longing to go back to Egypt even though they were slaves and they were mistreated and uh, you know in Psalms 103 I call this God's benefit uh, package if you read that psalm he says he removed us as far as the, our sins as far as the east is from the west and he buried him in the deepest sea and you know what he posted a sign there at that sea and it says no fishing so don't go fishing in the sea of forgetfulness because that's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to think, well, I was better off before I went to that abundant life. I was better off before I started paying tithes. I was better off before I listened to that Woody, that preacher. And, you know, uh, but we got to remember that what God what God saved us from you know from death and hell and the grave you know and gave us eternal life but anyway let's let's turn to Exodus chapter 14 to start with this is the earliest earliest record of the Israelites rebelling against Moses and I'll start with uh, verse 11 here. And uh, he says, they said to Moses, was it because they were, now this is when they're getting ready, they come to the Red Sea, and the Egyptians decided they, they, they're going to go bring him back. And uh, they, they can see the dust off the chariots and the horses, and they're coming, and there's the Red Sea. And uh, so they were, they were kind of in a fix. They were between a rock and a hard place, so to speak. And he says, then they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out in this desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing out us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in this desert. And then in verse 13, Moses said, 
answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see. The deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you'll never see again. Amen. And he, they didn't. You know, <clears throat> uh, there were studies done on that, and when that water piled back, it was congealed. Congealed means solid. It was actually probably ice. And they went through on the dry ground, and when them old Egyptians come in there, and he left them all get in there, then it, it closed in on them, and it crushed them and drowned them. And then, of course, you know, uh, the story of Marion on the other side, you know, she was, she was singing and rejoicing because there was all the dead Egyptians. And they didn't see him no more. But th it didn't end there. So let's go uh, to Numbers chapter 14. And we're going to look at uh, verse 20 and, or 1 through 4 right now. Uh, second here. Uh, now this, this is where they came through the desert. God did all these miracles for them. He, uh, it, it's, it said that it would, to feed those people, it would have took 200 boxcars of food a day. Imagine that. There was over three, three some point million people. And uh, their clothes never wore out. Their sandals never wore out. And uh, I don't know about you, but if I had a pair of sandals last that long, I, I'd want another pair. But anyway, they, uh, so here they are, they're getting ready to, they, they cross the Jordan, and they're, uh, they're getting ready to, or they were getting ready to cross the Jordan, and you know, they're, or they had crossed the Jordan, and so Joshua was in charge then. Moses had been taken up to heaven, or God took him, because he disobeyed God by striking the rock. And uh, anyway, God said, "You're you're not gonna, you know, you and Aaron's not gonna enter the promised land. You you'll see it, but you won't enter it." So anyway, uh, they're getting ready to. Uh, they're getting ready to send send uh, 12, 12 spies out to, to explore the land. And uh, one from each tribe, and Caleb and Joshua. So they, they sent these uh, spies out, and uh, they came back. And it says uh, in verse 27 here, they gave Moses an account. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. But these people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Anakites live in the Giv, and the Hittites, Jezbeites, Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses said, We should go up and take possession of this land, for we can certainly do it. But all the men who had gone with him, we, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw were great size. We saw the Nephilim, which were giants. They were descendants of Anak, come from Nephilim. We seem like grass, grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. So these ten, ten men, they, they, they spread a bad report, and they, they put fear in the people. And after God did all these miracles in Egypt and led them all through the promised land, anyway, it says that night... The people of the community, this is chapter 14 now, verse 1, voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly said to them, If we only had died in Egypt or in this desert, why is the Lord bringing us into this land only to have us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. <laughs> now, can, can you imagine how, 
no wonder the anger of the Lord burned, you know. And actually, he, 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 he wanted to destroy him right there. But it says Moses and Aaron fell face down and, uh, and, and prayed in their behalf. And uh, then if we go over to verse 20 and 22, after Moses interceded for him, says the Lord replied I have forgiven them as you ask nevertheless as surely as I live as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth not one of these men who saw my glory in my miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert who disobeyed me and tested me ten times not one of them will see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers not one has treated no no one has treated Treated me with contempt will ever see it because my servant Caleb ha has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he went to see, and his descendants will inherit it. So Caleb and Joshua is the only ones. And if you read on, every one of those men that spread that bad report, they died. God snuffed them out. But they didn't even get a chance to go for 40 years in the desert. But then he led them from there, 40 years in the desert, round and around, till every one of them died. And, and the children they were worried about would be taken and made slaves by the Nephilim and the Anakites and the Jezebites. Guess who inherited the promised land? Those children. When they, they were the ones that God gave the promised land to. Not, not the parents, not the ones that feared for these children. Uh, anyway, okay, now we're going to look at something else in the Bible. Well, Genesis uh, chapter 13. We're going to look at another. Uh, Genesis chapter 13, 10 through 12. Now this is this is about Lot and Abraham, and uh, you know Lot was Abraham's nephew, and they set out, and uh, they left the land of the Chaldeans, which the pastor said here a couple weeks ago was they were in idol worship and everything else. But anyway, uh, they they after being together for a long time they both became very powerful with sheep men servants man servants uh, uh, just they were they were just too big to stay together so uh, Abraham said to lot they're, actually, their herdsmen was fighting amongst each other about water and about grazing, and there just wasn't enough uh, area to support two large groups. So Abraham said to Lot, well, you pick where you want to go. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Now, I, you can't get a better deal than that. So... It says, Lot looked up in chapter 10 there and saw the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt towards Zor. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan, set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abraham lived in the land of Canaan while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, were sinning greatly against the Lord. Be careful where you pitch your tent. <laughs> be careful, you know that song the children sing, be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little feet where you go. My mother always told us boys, I had four brothers, he said, she said, if you're with them and they do something, you're just as guilty as they are. Stay away from, you know, birds of a feather flock together. And I, I, I told my inmates that, I said, when you get out of here, don't go back to the same people that got you in the, to the snake that bit you. I said, stay away from those people. I said, because you're going to end up back in jail. And, and sadly enough, we used to do the parking lots on graduation day. And they, they had to, the canine was actually at the boot camp for about four years. And I, I was very good friends with them guys. 
and they would search the vehicles as they come in because once you're on a state premises you're subject to search you wouldn't believe the stuff they found in some of those cars those guys were breaking parole before they got off the mountain I mean booze guns saving guns some of them had guns dope and, and, them, and them dogs were pretty pretty amazing they would take those dogs around that car and they would they would go birdie unlock it they'd unlock it and that old dog right in the car <laughs> and I mean they would whatever was in there if it was even uh, dope residue I'll never forget this one black guy coming there and he had this real nice black SUV and it was in the spring of the year and it was sort of muddy and wet and the dog went birdie they opened the back that dog right over the back seat start pawing at the seat and they get man he's gonna rip all my seat <laughs> but anyway they, they found some dope but it believe it or not it had to be a certain amount before they could prosecute it actually state police was there a couple of times and they 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 found dope and it was in what they call a nickel bag cop said just make them leave i i can't pro they'll throw that out of court yeah so that's our law today of course we're seeing our law <laughs> exempted now but i'm not going to get into that but anyway uh like I said, uh, be be careful who you associate with. What you know, I when I worked at the boot camp, I heard I probably heard the f bomb 150 times a day. But you know, when I ate my lunch, I, I sat with guys. I know a couple of them was Christians and they didn't use that language and I didn't associate with those other guys not that I thought I was better I just didn't care to listen to that and uh, sometimes you, you couldn't help it but and we we had this girl come in from Muncie of course being we had female inmates there we had to go through this training about females Boy, she was a sergeant. She got up there and she started with the F bomb left and right. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, but that's just that's just the language we use here in corrections. I raised my hand. Yeah, I said I don't use that language, and I find that offensive to me. She went like that, you know. And uh, but anyway, like I said, we gotta we gotta be careful. Now let's go over to uh, Genesis chapter 19 here a minute. And we're going to look at 17, verse 17. Uh, this, is, this is where uh, Lot now, he's in, he's in Sodom. And you know the story, I'm not going to have time to read all through this, where the, the two men come and visit him. And they're angels. And they, they come, and they come to visit Lot to warn him of the oncoming wrath of God that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And he was telling them, you got to get out of here. And uh, because Abraham pleaded for him, you remember he, he started with 50, if you find 50, and went clear down to 10. And, and God kept saying to him, well, if you can find 10, I won't. Do well, they couldn't even find 10. So, you know, these angels appeared to Lot. And, uh, of course, the, the men of Sodom, they gathered around the house and they send those guys out. We want to we want to have sexual relationships with them, you know. And, of course, Lot said, no, these men are under my protection. And, you know, he even offered his daughters of all things. And, uh, but anyway, uh, it, the angel said there to uh, Lot in verse 15, it says, With the coming of dawn, the angels urged, urged Lot, saying, well, they, to back up a little bit, they struck those men all with blindness. The angels blinded them. But anyway, the angel says in verse 15, With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your daughter, two daughters who are here with you. It will be swept away when the city 
city is punished. And it says, When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. And as soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. But Lot said to them, No, my lords, please. Your servant, has, it, 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 your servant has found favor in your eyes, and you have shown great kindness to me in sparing my life. But I can't flee to the mountains. The disaster will overtake me, and I'll die. Look, here is a town near enough to run to, and it is small. Let me flee to it. It is very small, isn't it? Then my life will be spared. And uh, the angel says in verse 21, he said, Very well, I'll grant you this request too. I will not overthrow the town you speak of. But flee quickly because you, I cannot do anything until you reach it. That is why the town was called Zeor. And uh, anyway, over in verse 26, it says... Uh, but Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Okay, why did why did she look back? She 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 loved she loved that sinful place. She she wanted she wanted to go back. She was looking to see if the angels was really right in their pronouncement. And I believe by then, maybe already, the sulfur and the hell come down out of the sky and was destroying it. But she couldn't help herself. She looked back because she loved, she loved Sodom and Gomorrah. She loved what it stood for. She loved the sin. And it cost her her life. It, she turned into a pillar of salt by not obeying what the angels had told her. And uh, so, like I said... We, we got to be very careful uh, not to not to look back and long for the good old days or you know how, how many of us have said boy if I wasn't a Christian I would let that person know what I think or I'd, I'd give that guy a knuckle sandwich you know well it's really saying you know, just let me take time out, Lord, just for a minute till I give this person what they deserve. And, you know, I had to have him down to boot camp. I, when I first started there, there was a guy, and he was a messenger right from Satan. And he buffeted me every chance he got. He just made my life miserable. And as soon as I'd say something to retaliate, he'd say, you're on probation. Because down there, he was on probation for a year. And if you got in trouble, the union couldn't represent you. They could fire you without any qualms. And he'd use that. He'd throw that in my face. Well, one day, he, he got in my face, started poking me in the chest. I said, you poke me one more time, I'm breaking your finger off. And then uh, it, it, it escalated from there. I should have walked away from him. I said, I'll tell you what. And then he said, you're on probation. I said, you pull off tonight down at the power line on the other side of the perimeter. There's no probation there, and we will settle this once and for all. Well, I got, after I did that, I thought, oh, man, you know, Holy Spirit started dealing with me. I, you know, if I do that, I'm going to blow my testimony so bad, and God started convicting me. And I, I had to go back to him, and I had to apologize to him, even though I didn't do anything. I said, look, I lost my temper. As a Christian, I shouldn't have done that. And if I did anything to offend you, I apologize. And he just, he, he was shocked. But it still didn't deter him. He still come after me five or six more times. Well, as the years went on, he developed a relationship with a, with a, they, they made the mistake of letting girls come over and work in the maintenance. And he had this little girl and he was bringing her in contraband. He was bringing her in uh, McDonald's. And 
and he was anyway make a long story short they could have fired him they did fire him but he had a, he had a choice either resign or we're going to send you to jail she he even bought this girl a car after she graduated put money in her inmate account he was dirty but anyway uh you know they they ended up getting rid of him and uh but you know, and then I, I, a couple years later, I was, I was in True Value, and I, I saw him, and he come walking by me, and I said hello, and he called me a filthy name, you know. So I didn't do anything to him; he did it to himself, you know. But uh, a lot of times, we just need to leave God handle the situation. And after after that episode, then I, I just started when he'd start, I'd just walk away from him. And uh, but anyway. Uh, I have something I want to read here. This is this is from the word today. Today. I don't know if any injury this it is really good. And this this was Saturday, June the tenth. Listen, this will fit in with what I was saying this morning. If you are serious about wanting a better life, you must change the way you think. The best way to stop thinking about something is simply to think about something else. When you don't enjoy a certain TV program, what do you do? You switch the channel. Does the channel you don't like no longer exist? No, there's any time you choose to switch back to it. Likewise, when you find yourself stuck in a repeated pattern, thought pattern, that's detrimental to you, one that plays like a broken record in your mind, take action. Refuse to loan your mind to the devil for his scheme. The only place that a thought can live in is in your mind. The only power a thought has over you is the power you give it. God says, I have set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Therefore, choose life. God gives you the options, but he don't exercise them for you. Choosing the right thought is like flipping a light switch. It dispels darkness and illuminates the room. Your most dominant thoughts will control your life and make sure they line up with God's word today. Fix your mind and change your life. That's pretty good. Uh, you know, like I said, uh, the first, first piece of armor we put on is a helmet of salvation because that's where the devil lives, right here. You know, he he can, let's face it, that's where we're weakest, right here. <laughs> you know, and uh, the helmet of salvation, that's why we need to put it on each day because, man, he'll he'll do a number on us and he'll, he'll get in our thought train. And, you know, the little cartoon they used to show, the angel sitting here and the devil sitting here, that's pretty true. You know, because... Uh, Satan, you know, he'll, he, he knows our weaknesses. He knows our Achilles heel. You know, the great Greek warrior Achilles, that's how the, the Achilles, they say your Achilles heel, that's how they killed him. They shot him in the Achilles. And I, I tore my Achilles off one time, and I'm telling you, that is, that is a tough injury to come back from. And uh, if you get your Achilles ruptured, you're not going to go nowhere but down on the ground. But anyway, now I have another one here, and this one's good too. This was actually December the 29th. That's my birthday. I don't know when I cut this out. But this, this ties in with what I said today. The story of the Israelites is like a lot, a lot like our own story. God blesses us, and then we forget them. Not totally, just until we get into the next mess. Then we call for his help again, and he intervenes on our behalf. Now, would you think we'd see the light, change our ways, and give God its rightful place in our lives? But we, we don't, often don't. We just repeat the pattern, keeping God in the basement like a janitor, calling on him when we've another mess to clean up. The Israelites were no different. They rescued, he rescued them from their enemies and redeemed them from their foes. Then the people believed his promises. Then they sang his praise. Yet how quickly they forgot what he had done. 
They wouldn't wait for his counsel. In the wilderness, their desires ran wild, testing God's patience. Someone has said, we're not slow learners, we're just quick forgetters. We do forget God so easily. Busyness. We don't take time to read his word, pray, compartmentalize. We keep God in the Sunday morning slot or, a, or for a brief devotional time. Selfishness. Their desires ran wild, testing God's patience. We refuse to gather, govern our minds by the principles of Scripture. Realizing the tendency to forget God, the psalmist wrote, You are my Lord, apart from you I have no good thing. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. So, you know, uh, my brother David, minister for many, many years, faithful servant of God, he always called a foxhole religion. He said, when the bullets are flying, we, you know, just like 911, everywhere you went, God bless America, God bless America. And that soon went by the wayside. And, and now, in Congress, they don't even, a lot of them don't even believe in doing the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, you know. And, uh, but, you know, he always called a foxhole religion. You know, when we need God, and we're in the foxhole and things are things are tough and then we we call on them and then we soon forget we uh we treat them like this thing said we treat them like a janitor we keep them in the basement and when when we make a mess of things then we call on god hey hey god fix this fix this you know and uh thank god he's merciful you know and uh Thank, thank God we're living in the new and better covenant. Uh, because the Israelites were under the law, you know. And, uh, you know, that one time Moses said, uh, you know, when he was up on the mountain and he come down with the Ten Commandments and he had, here, you know, Aaron had made the golden calf for him. He, he said to him, uh, strap on your who's with me strap on your swords and go throughout the community and they they killed a lot of them they they you know to to take god's wrath down so how would you like a pastor like that <laughs> you know pastor pastor moses strap your sword on and that guy that's over there worshiping that calf go over and cut his head off you know and uh, but anyway well that's all i have i hope you uh hope you enjoyed it and uh does anybody need prayer today here? Uh, okay, I need prayer.